right. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us. We're back with another Natural Growing Through Biology podcast series. I'm Steve. I'm Dennis. And uh, glad so, to have you guys here. Yeah, thank yeah. you. It's fall prep time, fall application. Uh, we've made it through the another growing year, another season. Yes. We still have some crops that are yet to come off mm-hmm, the trees mm-hmm. but uh, and out of the field. Yep. But for the most part, we're already looking to next season. And that's what we want to talk, fall prep and applications for the upcoming year. Yep. So we've gone through a lot of the, the information, initial applications in spring, foliar information throughout the growing season. And now we get kind of some different questions that oftentimes come in. So I wanted to throw out, we, we have a few here that kind of commonly come in. So I'm going to throw them out. And then we're going to kind of dive into them a little bit. So common one is when should I start irrigating after harvest? How should I treat my plants, trees, soil after harvest to prepare them for the next growing season? How late into the season can I continue applying nutrition slash foliars? And how late in the season can I continue to apply biology? And that's an inferro, a fall primer, a digestion. There's all sorts of different ways that we can be approaching that. So first off, okay, so those are some of the basic questions. Yeah, and so a lot of times what I look at to answer these questions, we'll kind of go through this and talk a little bit about whether we're talking tree fruit or tree crops Mm -hmm. or we're talking annual Mm -hmm. crops or row crops or whatever that, because it's going to be a little bit different in each scenario. You know, it's it's, I was actually laughing because I told a grower the other day about taking plant sap analysis, and we were talking about that a little bit. And I always said plant sap analysis on corn after harvest is really good. (laughs) Well, obviously we can't pull a plant sap analysis on corn after it's harvest. But, yeah. So there is no post-harvest. But anyway, we'll talk a little bit about that as we move on through this presentation. But what I always look at is what are our plants telling us? Go back to the basics. Um, what did we see that year? Um, let's look at our plants list. You know, a lot of times I chat with the grower and a lot of times that information makes decisions mm-hmm. on what we're going to do for the next year. What, what do our plant saps tell us? All those types of things. Because we always say test don't guess. Absolutely. Um, you know, and, and at this time of year, again, it's an, it's an opportunity for us to look at that history, look at that information of our soil analysis, our plant sap. What are we going to do nutritional wise for our row crops, the winter crops that are going in? But also, how are we going to treat these plants based off of going into the fall? Because mm-hmm. that information, a lot of times biologically also gives us an indicator of what we might want to concentrate on or use. Well, and environmental, I mean, this year is different than last year is different than the year before. We have ever-changing systems, and we kind of have to be ready to adapt to that. So looking back and kind of thinking through, okay, so I had a cool, wet spring, and then it really warmed up. How did my plants respond? What weed species did I start to see? So we can go into some of less of the hard data and into some of more of the qualitative data, looking at things, looking at the soil, those smells. We've got to take all of our senses into account. If, if we're just driving the information on one soil analysis or one sap analysis, that doesn't tell us the whole story. So it's this idea of collecting all of it, and now that we're in fall, we should have a little more time to kind of process and dig into that. Well, and we have to remember that all of this information and this data that we gather is a snapshot in time. Yeah. Whether we're looking at biomakers based off Mm -hmm. of DNA sequencing, Mm -hmm. or we're looking at a leaf extract or plant sap Mm -hmm. analysis, that is just a snapshot at that given point in time. And a lot of times what I actually talk to grower when we gather this information, what were the environmental conditions at the time that mm-hmm. I took that analysis? Was it hot? I, was it dry? Was it wet? It all matters. It all matters. Yeah. And a lot of times, and I encourage growers to take that information and write it on mm-hmm. that plant sap. What the temperatures were, what the conditions were, what things. So when you go back and look at that, it's an instant reminder. Oh, that's right. When I pulled these plant sap, I was under stress. We hadn't had rain for a little while. So obviously that information may be a little bit different the next year when we go to look at that sap analysis based off of environmental conditions. So if we have those records and we actually have that data written right on, then we don't have to go back to another app and look at the weather information and all those types Mm -hmm. of things. We have that all in one place. When we pull out our plant sap, it's written right on it. It has that information and it gives us those indicators. Knowing where you've been helps you determine where you're going to go. Yep. So one of the first things in one of those first questions was irrigation. We know that water is critically tied to yield and plant performance. That's just how it is. The most direct indicator of plant yield is moisture availability. But our our plants are done, so irrigation is done, right? Well, you know, a lot of times (laughs) what I look at, yes, exactly. Uh, 
As important that is to the plant environment, it is also very important to the microbial community within that soil environment. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times what I look at is we obviously, if we're gonna go out and we're gonna do a, a, a biological application, we don't wanna go out and do that in a dry, uh, no moisture environment in those mm -hmm. soil conditions, mm -hmm. because just like the plant, the biology needs moisture also. Yep. So a lot of times we have to look at that when we go into our fall application. So yeah, as soon as we're done with harvest, a lot of times we'll talk a little bit about this later, whether we're talking row crops or we're talking tree crops or whatever it might be, is how we want to irrigate and how we want to uh, um, apply it biological inoculums and our nutrition based off of that condition. So yeah, a lot of times what I say in the fall, as soon as we're done, run that irrigation cycle if we can. Mm -hmm. Get their moisture back in the ground. Maybe not for the crop, but at least for that biological community. Yeah. Get out and do your rain dance. Get you know that's, that's right. Yeah, we need that moisture in the ground for not only the biology but the next year's seeds. So and, and take notes on which rain dance you use so you can use the right one next year. I always use this okay. yeah. Okay. What I say is the outcome of a rain dance has a lot to do with timing okay he says that all the time we can't get him to quit <laughs> okay so we we know that data is important so we've gone out and we've rehydrated our, rehydrated our plants does that make a difference with our data gathering with our sap analysis our leaf extract analysis uh, well absolutely anytime we gather uh information based off of the plant sap i always say if we're in a re severe stress plant dry condition you know, the plant sap analysis is not going to give us the same information as if those plants were What's the difference stressed. between a grape and a raisin? Yeah, moisture. And it's a huge difference in what you see in concentrations of elements. Sorry. Okay, go on. No, and that's exactly it. So a lot of times we, we have to kind of look at that um, uh, based off of reading our sap analysis mm -hmm. and how we make that determination. But, you know, a little bit of what I want to talk about and, you know, as we move on here and we continue on is, so what do we do this fall? What are the initial applications that we're going to go ahead and go and do biologically? Because that's one of the things that I look at is, for an example, we talk about wheat, mm -hmm. um, dry land wheat, for an example. It's We've just had that hot, dry summer. Yep. It's, you know, 105 degrees outside. We've dried down that plant. We run the equipment across it. Now we have that bare ground, no protection. You know, we're baking that ground oh, yeah. within that environment. And now is a great time to, to kind of look at um, what can we try and do to accomplish uh, getting that biology back up and running. A lot of times we look at the fall application or this mm -hmm. fall primer the program mm -hmm. is a lot of times what we take a look at. So, um, you know, post-harvest, uh, we I always look at if we can get that application out there with light incorporation, mm -hmm. if we have a, a rain event, a lot of times in your dry land or right after a moisture event, it's, it's really hard at this time of year because a lot of the guys are trying to get their seed in the ground. And can we get that fall primer program for our crop that maybe isn't a winter crop, but mm -hmm. we're looking at our corn or our soybeans or uh, our garbanzo beans, whatever may be going into that field at the time, a fall primer really, I call it pre-digestion. It, it sets we're, you up. Yeah. We're setting up that soil, we're storing that field debris, we're break, starting that breakdown process, and we're storing that. So next year when we put that seed in the ground, all of that digestion is already done. We've given it a chance of a, you know, if we start this in October or uh, November, we can get this out there. You know, I was talking to a grower in Kansas um, just last week, and they quit doing the fall primer program a couple of years ago because they just thought, you know, it, it's really not worth the investment. The we, ROI we've been is doing not it. there. Yeah. We've been doing it. Let's let's go ahead and wait. And I, literally, I was just out there last week, and he, they went back to the fall primer program because they saw a change in overall plant health yep. based off of plant sap. Yep. They saw an emergent mm -hmm. difference uh, based off of plant emergence, seed emer seedling emergence. They noticed a difference in yield. All of those things were directly tied and they came back to, they're not doing anything different. The only thing they quit doing was that fall primer program. So having that biological inoculum to primer that pump, start things, getting ready for the next year is critical. When, what It's like 50% of the organic matter is made up of dead microbial bodies. Yeah, so dead microbial that, biomass. We want that biomass. We want those organisms. So we have that field debris. We have that residue. We want to break it down. And it's the microbes that are doing that. And it's also the microbes that are, that, that microbial carbon pump. They're 
pumping that carbon into the soil and helping stabilize it in some cases like glomalin decades yeah so we're, we're we're building our soil we're generating soil we're actually making humus and you know the thing about that in most cases we obviously if we're not doing a cover crop Obviously, everything that we can add to this system in the way of a cover crop mm -hmm. is going to enhance oh, that digestion, yes. enhance that microbial crewing. But um, in a lot of cases, the farmer I was actually talking to in Kansas, this is just a dryland farmer that is not doing a cover crop. Mm -hmm. This is just fall primer program without that. So even there, we see a benefit. See a benefit. Is the benefit going to be the same as if we add a cover crop and then we add the animal component? We always say all of those things that we can build on top of each other that we can start to stack will increase the overall expression. I guess environment dictates expression, as yeah. we said a thousand times, but also that microbial community, microbial function and that microbial diversity. Um, but we have to basically utilize the tools that we have available in our shed. Mm -hmm. And if our only tool right now is to do the fall primer and not do these other things, then it's better to do that than, as this grower said, not do anything at all. And a lot of times we look at, uh, we start to talk about products. Mm -hmm. um, you know, which product should I use on each one of these initial applications? And I think we'll talk a little bit about this later when we go in specifically specific. on mm -hmm. row crops or we talk more specifically on tree crops. But you know, a lot of times um, the Spectrum Plus Myco or the Spectrum PSB as we talk about um, is a great one if we're doing in-seed, in furrow application. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times at this time of year, the fall primer, a lot of times I'm just using the regular old spectrum. Yeah. Half rate of spectrum, a little bit of uh, Nutrinid. Um, you know, I know AEA uses Rejuvenate. Mm -hmm. um, you know, any of those biostimulants yep. or a food with that biology. So a lot of times we want to remember that it's that food and support that we need to talk about. And, the, you know, in the fall, temperatures are starting to go down a little bit. A lot of times a little bit of molasses in there, mm -hmm. give them a little bit of food to kind of jumpstart them, especially where we don't have an actively growing plant to put those exudates, exudates and those sugars into that environment. Mm -hmm. So a little bit of molasses, a little bit of kelp, carbon, trace minerals, you know, mm -hmm. we're going to see that. If we use our humates, obviously we're getting the carbon. Yeah. Plus, we're getting some trace minerals mm -hmm. in there. So fish with those amino acids, that, those fats, those oils, it's good microbe, good fungal food. Um, you know, all of these types of things can be added in there um, in order to send the microbes out with a sack lunch in the fall. You know, a lot of times what I look at is if we have a lot of crop residue, we need that nitrogen component. Yes. So the fish is critical. Mm -hmm. You know, a soy protein nitrogen application with the uh, biological fall primer sometimes gets that, uh, helps break that carbon chain. Uh, we don't want to go excessive with nitrogen because we don't want to burn everything up. No. We're just trying to start that process, start that digestive process and get those things going. And all the times, you know, I always talk about when biostimulates an enzyme product. Yeah. You know, we always look at our Nutrinid or our Pepsime G, our Pepsime C, any of those enzymes to help that biology break those bigger chunks down into smaller chunks, get that, just basically get that biological pump functioning. I, I mean, I always make it, it's, it's like trying to eat a 16 ounce steak as one bite or taking bites of it, taking those chunks out of it. That's what the enzymes are doing. They're breaking specific bonds. So like the cellulase enzyme is breaking glucose, the beta link glucose that makes up cellulose. That cellulase enzyme targets that one specific bond, that splits it off. So now the microbe has access to the glucose and it can directly use that glucose. And that's just one example, but it's, it's this idea of breaking things apart with the enzymes, the digestive enzymes, to allow that plants, those microbes, all of that living system to have easier and better access to it. It's kind of like chewing your food. It is. I like that. Oh, and I uh, wanted to share a little bit. So going on this idea of food, there is a difference between mineral fertilizers and organic inputs. What? That is? I know, right? <laughs> um, we've been working with Montana State for... Five years now. About five years now. Um, and some of the research that they're doing is, is coming out is very interesting. So I'm going to read a little quote from there. In contrast to mineral fertilizers, addition of organic inputs can increase the metabolic diversity of the microbial community and can have long-lasting effects on the soil microbial community and key nutrient cycling processes. Many of these functions are related to mineralization, which is the first step in making these nitrogen forms available for crop uptake. 
A meta-analysis of global nitrogen mineralization found that soil microbial biomass had a greater role in determining changes in nitrogen mineralization than climate, soil, physical, and chemical properties. Microbes are driving this, man. Uh, and we've always known that. That's what a lot of Dr. White's research yeah. is proving. I yeah. mean, this is coming out there. We've known this and felt this for a long time, and it's just so unbelievable to have mm -hmm. all these researchers to come out and validate that my, basically, as you always say, plant roots are not great at extracting nutrition. They need that microbial enhancement, mm -hmm. that foundation, that rhizophagy cycle for this to happen. But it goes well beyond that. Yeah. I mean, basically, just taking one out of the soil, it's literally changing that nutrient and making it a more bioavailable to the plant. Well, like that corn research, 67%, even when we're using a chemical fertilizer, the biology still wants to have a crack at it. It makes a difference with the uptake and availability of that nutrition. So even when we are feeding with a chemical fertilizer, uh, those microbes, they still want to be part of that digestion process and they're going to grab it if it's available. Well, and I, I love this statement that it, it, the diversity of that microbial community, it changes the diversity of that microbial community. And we've talked about that a lot for a long time. Mm -hmm. Everybody always talks about my bacteria to fungal ratio and all of those types of things. And, you know, I've always looked at when we look at the soil food web that there's a pyramid. Just, we talk mm -hmm. about this. The foundation of that pyramid is bacteria. It is. Yeah. And I always say that we have to build habitat in order to support life. I yeah. mean, we have to have the proper habitat. So as we build that bacterial community and we create habitat in an environment which is more conducive to mm -hmm. those fungal communities, just like when we look at um, the succession of building soil. Yes. We, you know, we start with rock, we go into you know, bacteria, then bacteria, fungal, and then we go mm -hmm. to that fungal. All of that is based off of building habitat, mm -hmm. environment in order to support them. And that's sometimes, I mean, what Montana State University found out is by just using a biological inoculum. And they use spectrum in this. They use spectrum, yeah. mm -hmm. which has no fungal community in it. What did they see? They saw an increase in what's known as alpha diversity, a greater diversity of fungal species. And it was a significant level of change. And I, and I love that idea. We're building homes. So on the smallest scale, the microbes are utilizing their extracellular polysaccharides. They're creating a biofilm that really literally bind these individual tiny particles together and that's creating their home. And as soon as you create a little bit more home, you have a more stable environment to allow better gas exchange, better moisture holding. And that allows, like you were just saying, the succession for this diversity and complexity of systems to increase. But we've got to start with that base level. Plants produce carbon, they feed bacteria, and that's kind of where things start. Well, and, and Bruce used to talk about that was one of the ideas behind the plant growth promoting rhizobacteria mm -hmm. is to have a group of organisms there based off of function mm -hmm. that do specific things to help increase plant growth. As we increase plant growth and health and root development, we've seen all of those roots with the yeah. dreadlocks on them, all those fine root hairs spitting those microbes back out through the rhizophagy cycle as they bring them into the meristem and we create all these um, the root morphology, mm -hmm. morphology is changed and we see that development. All of that is building health and environment. And when we start to do that, we start to see everybody show up. All the other players come onto the field and it creates a better environment for him. And that's really what's happening Doesn't here. Kevin Costner's dad show up then? He, he does, yes, oh, in that field okay. of dreams. Oh. That would be it. I mean, if you build it, they will come. That's <laughs> what we're talking about here. <laughs> okay, so let's... Let's build something specific and we're gonna dive hard shift. Let's go to row crops. Let's yeah. talk about, let's dig in like we said we were going to, let's dig a little bit deeper into row crop. And how do you approach it? What do you do in the fall? You know, in the fall application, obviously, what are we, are we doing wheat? Are we doing corn? What are the crop that we're planting? And what are the main focus of the nutrition that we have struggled with. What is our greatest limiting factor, mm -hmm. I guess, is what I'm trying to say here. So my recommendation always is, if we're doing, uh, obviously, winter wheat in furrow application, um, if we can get that microbe, and we talked about those microbe food, the molasses, the mm -hmm. carbon, all of those, the fish, all of those things, in with the inoculum, with the seed, Obviously, from what we've talked with research out there is the expression of that seed, the overall root morphology, the overall 
chance of uh, yield, mm -hmm. all of those things start at the point of germination. And so if we can have that right around the seed to help with that, we see quicker seed emergent, better root development, better microbial um, colonies around the, the root mm -hmm. of that plant. That um, the uh, What am I trying to say? The root, the roster root, the dreadlocks, all, all the rhizosphere? The rhizosphere. Oh, okay. Rhizosphere. That's a, that was a hard word for me it, to come up with today. Stuck. Man, I'm I know. tired. I know. Uh, anyway, so the rhizosheath, that rhizosphere, we start to see that microbial community build mm -hmm. Up, mm -hmm. upon that. And that's really critical to setting up the overall health and nutrition of that plant for its entire growing season. Yep. I mean, this is a fall. We want it up out of the ground. We want it healthy. We want it happy. We want to reduce environmental stresses, mm -hmm. you know, temperature, frost, all of these types of things that we deal with, drought. This biological community can help with each and every one of those as we start to talk about it as we move forward. But if we can't do, obviously, some guys aren't set up to do uh, in furrow application on their grain drills, mm -hmm. especially the wheat guys. Yep. So a lot of times I look up, well, let's do a seed treatment. You know, a lot of times we're looking at, you know, if I'm uh, doing the Spectrum plus Myco, if we're doing uh, Mycorrhizae, if we, you know, want to continue that, this is a heavily tilled field. We know we've disrupted those microbial communities. Yep. Let's use the Spectrum plus Myco. If this is a no-till environment, we want to reduce nitrogen, let's uh, use the Spectrum NFB for the nitrogen fixing bacteria. Yep. Um, let's get those guys in there so we can reduce our nitrogen load. We've talked about that. I mean, we just talked about, you had mentioned the corn, 60% of the corn, even with fertilization, 60% of the nitrogen comes from somewhere other than the nitrogen that we apply to bioavailable form of nitrogen. Yep. Let's get those nitrogen fixers out there if that's what we're trying to do. And a lot of times we can do that as a seed treatment mm -hmm. if we can't do it in furrow with a liquid application. And if I'm doing a dry seed treatment, a lot of times I'll say, what dry product can I mix with that to make it a little bit easier to apply you're to the seed? Well, you're still trying to add some you food. Know, I'm adding some mm -hmm. food, you know. I've used, there's a five-way blend out there that has a little phosphorus, a little bit of humate. Um, it has a little soy protein mm -hmm. nitrogen. Love it has it. a little biochar. Yeah. It has all of these things mixed together in it, and it all micro food. We're putting it out at pounds to the acre. Yeah. Small amounts. It's, it's micro food, but it helps stick that to that seed. And a lot of guys, what I have do it, they're just dusting it in the auger as they're basically augering it into their seed drills. I have some guys that are filling their seed drills in there. As they feed their seed drills, they're dumping some powder on top that mm -hmm. kind of as it moves and works into the soil, it shifts down through that seed. Some of it, yeah, it doesn't stick to the seed, but it falls in furrow as we're applying that mm -hmm. down through the row. And then we get cross inoculation through the roots in the rows of the environment of the plant. So all of these are better than not to do anything at all. We need that biological community in there for plant expression. Yes. Without those organisms, the rhizophagy system doesn't function. Yeah. And without the rhizophagy system, the plant can't feed itself. I, that's it, when you break it down as as brutally as that. That's what we're seeing, and that's what the research is starting to show us more and more. That, like Dennis mentioned earlier, and I say regularly, the plants aren't great at feeding themselves. They need help. Well, and we've seen this proven based off of treated versus untreated in the plant sap analysis. We see yeah. higher nitrogen. We see higher phosphorus. Mm -hmm. We see our high mag. We see our higher uh, magnesium. We see our higher trace minerals, cobalt, silica, all the way down the road. We see all of these nutrients better higher, uptake. Yep. better uptake. And a lot of times we see higher nitrogen, and that is when we've applied one, applied one third the nitrogen to the soil environment. Yeah. We see higher levels of nitrogen in the biological than we do in the conventional. And again, that just goes back to the idea of what form does the plant want? Well, and, and the idea that, uh, that the cell wall of these microbes is actually functioning as kind of a sponge that soaks up a lot of metals. It's, it's kind of its own CEC. It has the capacity to take some of these minerals, whether the microbe takes them in or not. Some of those minerals can be brought to the plant simply because of the cell wall structure. They attach to the cell wall structure. It's just and they're cool. They piggyback in. Yep. I mean, yeah. Yep. Grab some more and carry it in. It's like a little, yeah. little tiny backpack. Yeah, and we've got some pictures here. You obviously can't see them, but Great I want to describe Great for podcasts. I know. We, I, we love to have pictures it, for podcasts. More of our, I need pictures as a reminder. <laughs> you know, if I got a book and it had too many words in it, I was putting it back. I yep. wanted the picture book. Um, 
But you know, I've, I have growers now that on their discs, they're setting up dribble tubes so that they can apply a little bit of biological mm -hmm. inoculum in that fall primer. Uh, you know, if they're out there, I've got growers that are ripping. Some mm -hmm. guys are ripping because they have a hard pan yeah. scenario. And the easiest way to get through that is we fracture, we break it down, we get water, we get oxygen, we get that down into that environment. Get the roots going there. So we can get it down mm -hmm. through that. But I'll, I have growers now in Canada, in uh, Kansas, in Nebraska, that on their ripper, they've actually put dribble tubes at two points. One up in that top profile, yeah. that one to three inch profile. Mm -hmm. They put another one down wherever the hard pan layer is. If it's at six inches, eight inches, wherever that hard pan layer is, wherever we're ripping just below that to fracture it and open it up so that we can uh, get biology in there, oxygen, and we can start building structure again and reducing that capture. And they see that speeding up the process. Yeah. So it's pretty amazing. I would tell, Give a farm, if a farmer doesn't have a tool, he'll build it. Yeah. What, whatever that scenario might mm -hmm. be. If I need to modify this tool, it's not what I want, I'm gonna make it mine. Give a farmer a welder and a problem and you're gonna have some crazy things come out of it. And that's kind of what we're seeing here. And it's it's this idea of anytime we're opening, it's like a root dip. Anytime we have access to the area that we want the microbes, we're opening up the soil when we're ripping. We're opening up the soil with our discs. As soon as we're opening it, we can deposit the organisms in the seed zone, in the root zone, where we want them. So why wouldn't we? Yeah, and you know what? I mean, Give there's a lot of or uh, controversy out there, no-till, till, which is the best. And a lot of times what I say, whatever environment you're working in now and moving towards, yeah, um, let's utilize these bio the biology in the way that makes the most sense to help us move there quicker. Mm -hmm. We're adding one more step of that ladder. We've just moved up one rung on the ladder. Yep. Every time we can do that, we're going to increase plant health, soil health, yield, water holding capability, all the things that we talk about in biological form. Well, and that, that ladder is kind of a reverse pyramid. We start off with very little capacity and we end up with basically plants on life support where we have to throw everything at them just to keep them alive. We go up a rung and we have a little bit more capacity, a little bit more resilience. And as we go up that higher and higher, all of a sudden we have plants that are drought resistant, that have the capacity to feed themselves, that are no longer stressed by either biotic or abiotic issues. Stress. Yes, and mm -hmm. that's the best way to put it. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about trees and Okay, shrubs we're switching here. gears again. Okay, we're, yeah. Row crop. Woo. We trees. got out of the row crop. We all got our seed in the ground. We got our biology in there Yay. with it. We understand why it's it's happy at this time of the fall. And now we're going to kind of go into our tree. So a lot of times what I say, with our tree fruit, with our nuts, whatever it might be, with our uh, perennial crops, let's just put it that way. That's a good way to put it. That's a good way to put it. Um, so after harvest, the first thing I like to do is get a good irrigation out there, get moisture back in that pile. A lot of times we shut down the irrigation system during mm -hmm. harvest. We keep it dry depending on how long the pickers are in there, the equipment's in there running up and down the rows. We're creating compaction. We're, We're stressing. A, a bad environment. Yeah. Um, and so let's get some moisture back in that plant. Let's reduce that stress. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times, as we talked about earlier, we got the dry ground. Let's crank up our irrigation system. Let's re-wet that soil. Let's then add a biological inoculum based off a of function. A lot of times at, at this point, I'm, I, I'm saying our spectrum PSB. Mm -hmm. It's a phosphate solubilizing bacteria. We're going into the fall. We need phosphorus energy. in our plant. We need energy. We need root development. And that is a key component of all of the other nutrient uptake. So yep. let's get the PSB out there. Let's get that functioning and up and growing. And then finish our irrigation cycle. Um, and then I, a lot of times what I say is we don't want to pull a plant sap at this time. Again, we have a stress plant. It's not going to give us good information. Let's that plant rehydrate. Wait three to five to seven days. And then let's put a foliar application. Mm -hmm. If we have information from our previous um, foliar uh, plant sap, let's take that information of what our deficiencies were and let's go ahead and put energy back in that plant. Yes. We've already set next year's crop. Mm -hmm. Let's put the energy in order to support that crop yes. and get it into the winter time. So a lot of times what I'm looking at is on my first application, I want potassium. We've just set a crop, we've utilized a lot of potassium mm -hmm. um, to fill whatever that crop was. Potassium is great, antifreeze, for the plant world. Stomata really opening, good. closing, antifreeze. Mm -hmm. all, all that support. So my first foliar is gonna be a little nitrogen, a little potassium, trace mineral package based off the information of the plant sap. Let's get that energy back in that plant. Let's yep. get that plant photosynthesizing and functioning again. And then 
if we can, pull a plant sap, and then let's do another application based off of that plant sap. But a lot of times that's calcium. Let's get that calcium yeah. into the plant in the fall before the tree goes dormant. Let's get it around the buds, the stems, all of those places that we can set that calcium because that is the first thing we're going to need next spring. And some silica so, as well. Silica, mm -hmm. yeah. All of that in the fall application is generally what I'm talking about. You know, when we talk about a little bit of nitrogen, obviously like a soy protein form of nitrogen, fish mm -hmm. form of nitrogen is always what I'm recommending. You know, it's a little fulvic acid yep. out there with this to help, um, you know, it. the micro uh, 5,000 mm -hmm. organic. Um, let's get that out there or the regular micro 5,000 um, would be in my first application because I'm trying to put energy in that plant. A lot of times I'd go with the PZ 1000 if we're not, if we're conventional um, for that second application okay. because that's more an emphasis on potassium. Yep. Get that into the plant as our second foliar application. Let's put these guys uh, going into the winter as healthy as we possibly can because that's going to determine how they come out next spring. Well, and we've we've talked a lot about nutrients for the system for the foliar, but the microbes on the phylosphere are critical as well. All of those functions that we've been talking about, nutrient uptake, plant protection, uh, communication, all of these things, stress reduction is I guess a better way to put it. All that's going on and we can also increase our efficiency, like you were just saying, a little bit of nitrogen. We can apply nitrogen fixing bacteria to the phylosphere and allow that plant to have better access to nitrogen as the growing season's going on. Yeah, and you know, I mean, the exciting part about talking about that, one of the really exciting things that we have coming up here is that we've got a new product called NF Boost, yeah. which is our nitrogen fixing foliar product. It's been in development for the last three years. Mm -hmm. We've done a lot of research with it and trials. We see really, really good response as especially an early spring application. Yeah on row crops early spring. Obviously the nitrogen fixers, the earlier we can get them on, the better they can give us that support, especially during those periods of hot, dry times. Mm -hmm. If we have it on early, and then we get that period of hot, dry, where the roots aren't functioning great, there's no moisture, they can't move nutrition up that plant. We have these phylosphere nitrogen fixing bacteria that are on the leaf, in the stem, all around that plant, which are now fixing nitrogen, which carries us through for that support mm -hmm. of that nutrition, that energy that we needed going later into that season during grain fill and all those types of things. So I'm really excited. I love this new foliar product. I know. I know we're supposed to be talking about fall stuff and we switched over to a spring type well, when product. Well, when you talked about this, the, the nitrogen and I nitrogen know. fixation, we had I, to. I had to throw it out there because I'm very excited about it. And you know, a lot of times I get asked the question, how late, hey, how late can I go yeah. on this? And, you know, I, I guess I look at as long as you have a plant actively photosynthesizing, we can be applying foliar nutrition. Mm -hmm. If sap's um, flowing, <clears throat> yeah. if photosynthesis is happening. And mm -hmm. so, you know, a lot of times, depending on the crop, you know, fruit trees, things like how to harvest can be late, depending on varieties and all of those types of things. But if we, one foliar application is critical. I always love two. The more, the better, um, but you know we have to do what we can do based off of what may, Mother Nature gives us yeah. based off of environment. Yep. So everything that we can do is critical based on those applications. And again, we've already talked about it. Next year's crop is being set. Mm -hmm. So let's get it out there. Let's get that foliar and let's get those applied as many applications as we can prior to uh, after harvest. And strengthen those plants, allow them to go into their basically hibernation, into their <clears throat> down period with as much nutrition as they possibly can so that next spring they wake up, they've got as much in their reserve tanks as possible so they are able to start photosynthesis early, which allows them to get the exudates flowing earlier, which allows them to feed the microbes, which goes to more food. All of these things, it's all interconnected. It is. And so a lot of things that I say post-season planning, um, you know, I basically do this myself, especially mm -hmm. at the end of the year. And I, I generally recommend all, grow, all of my growers to do it. Um, it just gives us a tool to utilize for the next growing season. You know, uh, I, I love this saying, if you fail to plan, you plan to, or you plan to fail, basically. You plan to fail. It's by your buddy, B. Franklin. Yep. 
it'd be Franklin. <laughs> <laughs> um, so a lot of times what I do is at the end, take, take some time this fall after we get the seed in the ground, after we uh, get everything wrapped up for the season. Those things slow um, down. Slow you down. You've got a little time to process. Yeah, evaluate yourself. Yeah. You know, I always say that what things went right, uh, what things went wrong, what mm -hmm. do you want to do better? Make a mental note. I actually write it down. If I don't write something down on paper, it, it doesn't mean oh, as much to me same. as if, if I just think about it yep. or even put it in a computer. I have to put it on paper. Yep. Um, evaluate your program. What went well? What didn't work well? What things do you want to change? And mm -hmm. make notes. Um, evaluate the results that we had. Did, uh, you know, as Rick Clark said, uh, and uh, there's no such thing as failure, just no unexpected failure. outcomes. Yep. Yeah. That's it. Um, so, yeah, if, it, if, it, if what outcomes did we have that weren't expected, mm -hmm. what things went right, um, let's utilize that information while it's still fresh in our mind. Mm -hmm. Put it down on a piece of paper. How did harvest go? Um, did we achieve the yields we wanted? What things can we do differently to get a better ROI for the next season? Um, and basically, how did that impact not only our soil, our plants, our yield? How were those all Im impacted by our program? Mm -hmm. And what things do we want to do? Go back through our test results. Look at so it's fresh in your mind of what things we want to do. And then a lot of times I say, let's utilize that data for making decisions for next spring. Yes. Contact who, your suppliers, whoever that might be, with what products you're going to need for that next year so that we have an understanding and a list. Convey that information to them so that they know when it's time to get those products in. They already ready. have record. They should have record of that if they evaluated themselves at the beginning of the year and kept good records as you give them that information. So everybody's on the same page. They're ready to get started for growing into the next uh, growing season. Yeah, we want to get the strongest start possible. So that's why we're using nutrition, we're using foliars, but we're also utilizing data and information about our program and ourselves to make sure everything comes out in the spring. And, and biology. And biology. Yeah, absolutely. Which, which I mean, obviously, as we feel, is one of the most important parts. And there's other researchers out there that are kind of expressing that same information now, which is really exciting for us to see. So thanks, everybody, for joining us in Natural Growing Through Biology podcast series. Dennis, look forward to seeing you this winter. And I'm Steve, and we'll chat again here soon. Thank you. Bye.